Well, by day I'm a lawyer, and that's, that's actually how I got started in the Sherlock Holmes field, was when I was in law school, um, I had formed a resolution that I was going to study hard most of the time, but I was going to set aside an hour every day to do recreational reading. And uh, my girlfriend at the time got me the Baron Gould Annotated. She thought I would like it, and wow, was she right. <laughs> I freely admit that what attracted me to Beringold was the footnotes. Um, it was that sense that there was um, a whole body of scholars, a kind of a cult, um, that there was scholarship, that there was minutia to be explored. Uh, that's what really interested me. The stories were great, but um, it wasn't the... I, I do tax law. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a criminal lawyer. I have no knowledge or interest in forensic science particularly. Um, so it was this, just the mind game parts of it that appealed to me. The first Sherlockian scholars, I believe, were um, really, there was something in the air in 1901 because there are three different pieces that appeared almost simultaneously. There's Andrew Lang's piece about the three students. Um, there's a, an American named Frank Sidgwick and a Canadian named J.B. McKenzie, all of whom wrote articles looking at the Sherlock Holmes stories from the point of view that they were true stories and um, finding flaws or, or questions about those stories. Those are really, as far as I can tell, the first pieces of Sherlockian scholarship that exist. There may have been people in 1891 who did this, but I can't find them, nobody else has seen anything like that. So, In the early days, the Baker Street Irregulars um, was not really conceived, I think, as a literary society aimed at publishing brilliant Sherlockian scholarship. It was conceived as a drinking group where a bunch of people who really enjoyed the stories could sit around and talk about Holmes. Um, I think it wasn't until later, so some of them were writers, um, some of them were not, um, in, the, in 1934, there was some literature produced, but not a great deal, and there wasn't really an outlet for it, other than if someone happened to be a writer like a Vincent Sterrett, where he could put it in his column, or Christopher Morley, you could put it in his column. Um, it wasn't really until the founding of the Baker Street Journal uh, in the 1940s that the scholarly aspects of the BSI really became widespread. I think before that, there were probably the occasional paper presented at a dinner, um, but not the kind of scholarship, not, not the, the, what shall we say, the, the waterfall, the enormous amount of scholarship that, that we have today. The clincher finally turned out to be that I, in my spare time, liked to cook at um, a restaurant in Malibu called uh, the Malibu Kitchen, and one of the regular customers is Robert Downey. Uh, this is a takeout place. So uh, Robert was in the store one day and the owner was talking to him about, so what's your next movie? And he said, Sherlock Holmes. And the owner said to him, you have to meet Les Klinger, our friend who is uh, occasionally a cook. And um, he's the world's greatest expert. So Robert said, this is wonderful. I've been look I told the producers I wanted to meet the world's greatest experts. And here he is a couple of miles from me in Malibu. Um, so Robert called me up, would I mind meeting with him and talking to him? And at that point, he and I worked on it a little bit, and then I got into the, the, met, met the producer at that point said, well, okay. Um, the second film, they actually hired me. I love Elementary and Sherlock both. Um, I think they are terrific, fresh interpretations. Um, Sherlock is um, loaded with Easter eggs, as, as the computer people like to say, sort of little nuggets of lines from the canon, um, little touches of things. And that's, of course, a great treat in addition to clever stories. Um, PBS asked me if I would help do publicity for um, Sherlock, and I did it in the form of what I call tweet notes. I was doing live Twitter commentary on the episodes as they were airing, pointing out these little Easter eggs as they'd appear. I think the reaction to the new Sherlockians is deplorable, but um, I'm, I'm delighted that, that uh, so many people have found this. When, when the Downey films came out, for example, I was really excited to hear from people like Otto Penzler that sales of the canon were actually increasing. People were buying the original books to read the stories. Um, I think people who watch Sherlock to see Benedict Cumberbatch's cum uh, uh, cheekbones, that's wonderful because they'll get hooked and they'll find the original stories. Um, and then they'll find the scholarship and then they'll buy my books. Uh, 
I, I'm a little nervous about some of them, um, only because I, I'm not sure what I have to say yet. I'm not sure I can really speak to some of the academics who have now turned to this and discovered this is, as a new media and all that. But uh, Lori King and I are guests of honor at, a, uh, um, sh at the Sherlock Seattle Beacon, or something like that, I forget the name of it, um, in October. And I'm, I'm a little nervous about this. This is, this is this generation of Sherlockians that didn't come up in the traditional way of watching the old Rathbone movies or something. But I'm not sure, is that any different, really? If they got into it through Rathbone, they didn't get into it with any pure uh, source material either. So I think it's great that we have this whole new generation of Sherlockians.